the recording started. Um, thanks everybody for joining us. It's a little bit of a different time this Sunday. Um, yeah, well, this is going to be a great show. We've got two members uh, of the Silk team with us here today. You guys are um, familiar with Troy, but uh, Jeff is joining us as well. Jeff's our, uh, our general counsel, and we'll give you guys a bit of an intro to him as well. Um, yeah, over to you, Butters, if you want to just kick off the intros. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just like a... Uh... Just, it, tro let's start with Troy. Troy, if you could just summarize sort of your position at Silks, just, you know, some people listening to the recording are, are informed whether they know you're not. If you could do a brief overview of like what you do for Silks and like your, the day-to-day -day activities, um, what you sort of do on a day-to-day -day basis for, uh, for Game of Silks. Um, <clears throat> say that you probably could put me into like the COO role. Um, I, I spend numerous hours every day besides, of course, running tropical racing on, on the game of silks. Um, if it's part of the strategic gameplay, um, managing individuals in regards to uh, keeping up with uh, schedules that we set forth, in, uh, making sure the MVP is going to be launched, um, and everything really to do with the thoroughbred racing industry, period. Uh, anything that we bring in the gameplay um, to the designs of the horses, avatars, things like that. So I'm pretty involved in a, in, in a day to day uh, role in, in Silk. That's awesome, and and obviously you're you're more involved in like we well, go in tropical or heavily involved with tropical racing, which is uh, IRL Silks. Um, is there? Why do you think that? Uh, IRL like existing thoroughbred lovers should care about about game of silks um, and the web3 technological implementations and like the metaverse that we're creating here you know I, I, I tell this story all the time um, you know going back 35 years ago when I was training racehorses at Yonkers Raceway and uh, in reality, I wasn't training at that time, uh, probably just uh, grooming and living in the quarters. Um, but on a daily basis, me and a bunch of other horsemen, we used to sit around every single day and talk about, besides sports and the jets and things like that, but every day of how to make the thoroughbred or any racehorse industry better. And we've always came up with a, a few things. One, how do we bring in the younger generation? How do we make mm -hmm. uh, how the racetracks give in more purse money so we race for more money that would attract more people to come in because it's a better way to go ahead and uh, try to make some money in the racing industry. And I spoke about this, in this at the Saratoga um, conference just a few weeks ago, is it, it's really not turning out to be a younger generation. It's a culture. It's a, it's, a, it's a different culture that we've never seen before. And that's what the metaverse and blockchain and crypto is really doing for the thoroughbred horse racing is it's bringing in a whole new culture and a whole new set of eyes to the racing industry. And we found out that... Oh, we got a little rug there. I think we, we lost you a little bit. We might have gotten a phone call. As he was talking. Uh, yeah, because it kind of just like cut out really. <laughs> but, uh, you know, well, before we get back to like the, the, the more like IRL social, I think it ties in really well. If we, if we want to go over to Jeff real quick. Um, I'm sorry. Can, oh. can you guys? Yeah. Oh, yeah we can hear no, you. no, can hear you. no. I'm back. I'm back. I apologize. You know, I, I got to. Uh, hold on. I got to turn my phone. Uh, I'm sure. No. So. I just got a call. I apologize. So I this whole new culture that is that that is seeing um, that we're seeing in in the metaverse <laughs> is a perfect clientele for the thoroughbred horse racing industry or any horse racing industry, um, and that's what is really exciting for me. And I believe that's what's really being excited for a lot of people in the racing industry is that we're seeing this that we're seeing that the gamer silks came out at a at a, a really um, perfect time in the thoroughbred horse racing industry uh, where we're racing for a tremendous amount of money. We're bringing in uh, more people to the races that we've seen before, just statistically uh, with, at Saratoga. Horses' valuations are going higher. 
So it definitely seems that there's a trend happening. I believe it's coming from um, this new culture of the Web 3.0. And I think it's a perfect time for the horse racing world to attach themselves to the metaverse and vice versa. And it, it's done because of the new technology. You know, it, it, uh, fantasy sports is great, but fantasy sports is great because you can get yourself truly involved in the sport itself because there's so much ability to go ahead and to do research and to go ahead and watch it on TV. It's like just a common, common, you know, uh, discussion that people and their peers have. Horse racing was always left out because the states didn't want to tax themselves to sports. So now with the new technology that we could literally take and transport people from their desks to the racetracks, feel it, touch it uh, like they've never seen before, that's what excites me and what I believe that the two um, industries are really going to attach themselves to, and that's meaning the metaverse and the real uh, horse racing. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so exciting. You know, it's very immersive. We've heard you talk yeah. a lot about uh, it in the past. It's just great to hear you kind of sum up the, the uh, what am I looking for? The, the, the synergy between the real world and kind of the game that we're building. Um, and we'll get into that more as we go on. Um, yeah, let's just uh, let's turn it over to Jeff real quick. Just bring him into the conversation. Um, so the community, you know, hasn't been able to hear from you that much. You're, you're much more behind the scenes. So um, if you want to give a quick overview of uh, your role with Silks and, you know, how you got involved and, uh, you know, what exactly you're doing on a day to day basis. Yeah, so I am. Um, so I, I've been a, 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 a corporate uh, attorney uh, for about 26 years and um, have been involved in Web 3.0 uh, since very early on. Uh, and um, my role is, is as, as general counsel for Silks is, is to, uh, I'm, I'm in the background though, um, and um, looking and making sure um, that uh, we're legally structured properly, um, that we um, are doing things in a way uh, that, uh, that uh, are in compliance with, with uh, you know, all the various uh, laws that um, are implicated by what we're doing and, and uh, um, make sure we don't get into any kind of trouble and we do everything the right way. Yeah, I know we, we talk a lot of... I know we I mean, talked a lot in... Talk it on. <laughs> we talk a what's lot that? Of, what's that, Troy? I said that spot on, <laughs> Mr. Talk. Jeffrey. We talk a lot in terms of sure. about, uh, you know, how our game's going to operate in the open market in terms of um, you know, structuring uh, various ways of our game that'll um, both help us economically, but also structure our game in a way that can um, further incite us to grow. And so that's, you know, uh, include some of the changes that we made this week and, um, you know, to our, to our economic structure. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later um, as we kind of pick both of their brains on it. Um, but I guess the next question is for both of you, you know, more so, I guess, Troy, you already gave your answer, but for Jeff, um, you know, what is the, what excites you most about the game of silks? Um, you know, for somebody that may not have as much experience in the, in the horse racing industry as Troy. Uh, I'll, 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 t I'll tell you this, over the last uh, 25 years being a lawyer and an entrepreneur, um, I've seen... Uh, what I've learned is is if you've got a, a, a business with a, a great idea but but not a, a good management team and you've got a business with an average an average idea and a great management team, I'll back the, 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 the business with an average idea and, the, and, and a great management team mm -hmm. any day. But when you got it but silks, you've got a great idea, a great concept, and you've got a, a great management team. That's what excites me most about it, uh, is that you've got seasoned uh, business people that, that, that know uh, how to operate and build and structure uh, economically a business like Troy and Dan um, and, um, and, and Derek, our, our, our CFO. Uh, um, people that have been in the businesses been in business, have had successful, built and ran successful businesses, 
Um, and that, yet they've surrounded themselves with the younger generation, um, with, 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 with the younger people that are in tune with, 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 uh, uh, you know, how things are working in the younger generation. Like a perfect example is, is, uh, you know, um, I, I think one of the biggest differences between what's going on with web, web 3.0 and, and let's say the, the, the internet boom is, uh, but you know, back in, in, in the late '90s, is uh, Web 3.0. Its community is such a key component of it. Um, you know, it's the community, and um, and and we've uh, you know, Dan and Troy have surrounded themselves and brought in younger people that 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 know how to speak the language and to build the community, and um, and so yeah. So in a, in a nutshell, it's it's kind of this. The seasoned uh, business people that uh, um, know the fundamentals of how to operate and build a successful business and have done so in the past with with bringing in the younger people. Um, so. Yeah, that's yeah awesome. I think that's especially powerful from you coming from more of a back end side, like someone like me. I, I don't get to really see um, the super behind the scenes all the time, so. It's awesome that we got, we got, you know, I know that we have an amazing team behind this and I love what you said about having an amazing idea and an amazing management team. It's very exciting. Um, should we, should we bounce back to, bounce back to Troy? Um, yeah, Troy, do you have any, I mean, do you have any follow up, you know, to that? I mean, you work with, uh, you work with Jeff and Derek quite a bit, um, you know, as well as Dan, uh, as a community that doesn't uh, see their work as much. So if you have any more thoughts. Yeah, um, I, I, I do. And Jeff, thank you. Um, you know, th this idea of the game of silks, um, when, when the ve very general idea came, um, before I met Dan and when I was introduced to Dan, um, by a really good friend of mine, and, and it turned out to be a really good friend of Dan's also, you know, he basically said, there's only one person he knows, and he has a big Wall Street uh, background, very successful. He's, and he literally said that Dan was the only person he knew that could build this, that he, he, could, he could, you know, grasp it, understand it, expand on it, and build it. And when I met with Dan, and the first time, you know, we spoke, and then about three or four days later, um literally dan and i flew to atlanta airport and we met for about two hours at the airport just sitting and talking about the game of silks um i knew at that time that he really was the one guy that could pull this off and to and, and to build it and then from there from the people that he brought in jeff being one derek being one De benny being one michael like building this whole team I've I've really never uh, I don't want to say never, but because uh, you're not supposed to. But at the same time, it's very rare to see someone have the connections, the vision, and the ability to grow a team uh, um, through a, a single idea like the way he did. So I give Dan a, a, a tremendous amount of props and the ability to to put this together and put an amazing team together. So I, I agree with Jeff. Um, the, the, this the, the the game of silks is truly this would have never been able to happen ten years ago, fifteen years ago. It was just one of these perfect storms that the technology. Um, I said the other day to someone, I said it's kind of like Star Wars, where you know they made the first two Star Wars and they waited fifteen years because the te technology wasn't there to, to to make the next set of movies, and um, horse racing, fantasy horse racing. This wouldn't have been. We wouldn't be here today unless it was the technology, because that's going to make the game of silks truly the game of silks. So um, I, I agree. Everyone that's working on this project is just absolutely spot on. To, to even, you know, the moderators here at the, you know, the Discord. I, I've, I have built numerous companies, just like Jeff and everyone here. Uh, but amazingly, the one thing that we hear in common is besides our true badass graphics and, and and everything just looks you know to the top level but the community that we have here in discord i get so many compliments 
from the way that it's run, the people that's engaged, you know, you guys do a tremendous, a tremendous amount for this company. And that just says everything to us as a company, that it doesn't matter where each individual person is and what, you know, a title or without a title, but everyone in this company is so engaged and working towards one goal. And that's when it works. And that's when it's successful. So I want to thank you guys also. Thanks, Jeff, for the comment. But that, that says a lot about this company. And that's one of the main reasons why we will be successful. Thank you. Um, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I think, um, you know, just for the community, like when, you know, certain ideas or suggestions or comments are brought up, you know, these are the guys that, uh, you know, do all the heavy lifting with, uh, you know, putting their ideas together and talking about what works and what doesn't. And, you know, furthermore, we'll go into the, the technology, you know, as Troy just mentioned, um, you know, a couple of these aspects of our ecosystem that we've, uh, you know, uh, made some changes to in the, in, the, in, the, in the last couple of weeks. And so, you know, you guys being the brains behind it, you know, we just kind of wanted to, um, you know, pick your, pick your brains on, you know, how some of this will uh, affect the game moving forward. So um, I guess first for Troy, um, you know, what are, the, what are the current benefits for, you know, uh, for the Silks model that help uh, onboard existing members of the IRL race, uh, horse racing community into Silks? Um, so what benefits do they have um, owning horses and silks compared to the real world. I think this is something that's really important to set the stage. Are you, are you talking uh, e e economy-wise, or are you just talking about the just, real... Just an overview before we jump in. You know, um, amazingly is um, the, the idea and the idea of the real world, again, meaning the metaverse, I, I look at it as two two things one is i truly believe that the real world um horse owners and um the let's say the lodge owners i i believe they're gonna be able to use this as a, a hedge against some of the horses that they currently have and i, I give this example where if I believe I have a horse that's going to be a very successful horse, a horse that I believe might be on the Kentucky Derby Trail or might be just a nice horse, all of a sudden, the first race or second race, there's a horse that goes blowing by my horse. You know, I have a decision to make as a real live owner is do I try to go buy that horse? Do I try to go ahead and duck that horse for the next couple of races to hopefully my horse gets better? But now I believe I would myself, I would go out into the silks world and try to purchase that horse in the silks world huh. and then this way i have a you know a, a, an ability of making revenue or making money off another horse um that i don't own in the real world so if i do get beat it's not so bad that's one two is i believe what's going to happen also is some of the smaller investors some of the smaller investors that might own you know a little piece of horses here and there they'll be able to compete in this world, especially in the very beginning, where they can go ahead and purchase a whole horse possibility or maybe, you know, partner up and buy a few horses. And they'll be able to go ahead and bob and weave through the Silks um, game because they already know the real world. So in, in their mind, I believe they'll think they might have a little advantage. And I think they'll get more involved in the Silks world, which then again... We'll, we'll teach everyone else in, in there, in the game of silks, to, to really see how um, more investors are coming in and, and what they do in the game of silks. And then third, I believe that a lot of the breeding operations, like Tropical, you know, like Windstar and, um, you know, Land's End, and you would just name them all, I believe they're going to want a very big presence in the game of silks for numerous reasons. One is for marketing. So I, I do believe that we're going to see a lot of the people use the metaverse through the game of silks to in, um, to have the ability to do virtual tours, to go ahead and r really amplify what they have in the real world. And they're not going to be able to touch as many people. I believe they believe we're going to touch a lot more people in the metaverse um, than in the real world. So again, I think it's the diversification of marketing, investments, um, is is why i believe uh that this is you know again going to work in, in a very big way yeah you can bring so more people together through um the metaverse and like the internet that's huge when you say marketing, yeah you know I'll, I'll i'll give you i'll give you a crazy statistics there's 20 there's like 
basically 28, 29,000 owners in the United States of that owned racehorse. And, and what's crazy is those 28 or 29,000 people, we generate the business that we do generate, right? It's a $130 billion um, industry. So now just look at the game of silks. We've been on, we've been around for a year and we have 25,000 plus in our discord. And our game is still a month and a half or whatever it is away from being live or we we're selling horses in the next three weeks. So just imagine when the game is up, when it is running, what is, what, what's the potential amount of people to start jo joining this community and how long is it going to take for us to have 10 or 20 times the amount of people, uh, you know, uh, involved in the game of silks in the real world that that's when this, uh, you know, becomes as close to being in parallel or part in the racing industry. And we're not far off. And I agree. I think what you said about like the economics about, you know, kind of refeeding into the economy is really important. And that kind of leads us, you know, into the, the tokenomics kind of discussion, you know, that brings in both of you. Um, I, you know, first want to start with Jeff. Um, we talk about this cash model. I think it's really important to kind of understand, um, you know, first the, t the, the change that we made, you know, from the two token model. Um, but first, like, before we get into it and kind of how it protects us, you know, Jeff, how do, how do you think this protects us from certain security laws? Is kind of the, the basis for us making this change? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, the, the biggest risk with, 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 any, with any company that's going to release tokens is, 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 and uh, it, it is is well. There's two big risks. One is is regulatory risk, because we you know nobody knows. It's still the wild wild west, and the Se Securities and Exchange Commission is is is, is um, you know trying to regulate. The, you can imagine um, this. You know the, the whole token industry has blown up. The Securities and Exchange Commission has been regulating stocks and bonds for. 80 years, whatever it is, 1935, 32, and the Securities Act was written. And that's all it did for 80 years. And then in the last five years, this whole new genre of cryptocurrencies and tokens has evolved. And, um, you know, there's, and, and things continue to evolve. And, you know, we, we don't know where the regulators are going to, are, are going to land. And, you know, converting to a, uh, this cash model, one, eliminates that risk, the regulatory risk that, uh, you know, who knows what the Securities Exchange Commission is going is to come down and, 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 and do with uh, tokens and, and how they're going to classify them. But it also takes away a currency risk, you know, because of the fluctuation of, uh, you know, there's never been an asset class, I, I think, in the history of man that has fluctuated in value more than cryptocurrencies. And so um, by going to a, a cash model, we're really protecting, um, uh, you know, like a Terra Luna type event happening where, uh, you know, a token goes down to nothing. Uh, and, uh, you know, a DAO, for example, is left with, you know, it, you know, has, has lost, you know, eighty percent of their value over a week, right? Right, because it gets so, worthless. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So by doing this, essentially, we're we're maintaining the ability to constantly provide um, payouts through the ecosystem while um, you know tying ourselves to a stable coin to the cash model. Um, but you know, Troy, what what are your thoughts on this too? You know, I think it goes even further. Um, than that, what you were just saying, but the, the cash model is is simple, and I believe that the way that a lot of these games, let's just say, that failed, their economic structure were were very convoluted, and um, they put checks and balances in that just didn't work. And the one thing that we did not want to do was follow a path of unsuccessful play to earn games. So what we did was we sat down and we said, what's the simplest way to make this and the most transparent way to go ahead and help our community 
have a very successful kickoff while understanding every move that we're making. And, and that was the cash model. And there's, you know, one of the most successful fantasy games right now is Thorair. And basically, you know, we went ahead and dissected that economy and the way that structure is. And right now, we feel very confident that the game is going to go ahead and it's going to be able to work. It's going to be able to attract a lot of new people in the game because they'll understand the economics of the game. We have the ability to make changes for the better of the game at any time. And a game that is up and running and successful, that's what, all the, that's what our community wants and we want for the community. So that, that was why we went ahead and made that right-hand turn. But that also goes all the way back to the first question and what Jeff was talking about is with a, um, a company that has executives that has been successful, that has run companies, that we, we do have the ability to go ahead and make those decisions uh, and, and at least start the conversations to make sure that we, we are in a perfect spot. Because the last thing we wanted to do was go ahead and start a game that was going to have to change um, drastically. So we wanted to go ahead and make it as simple as possible and with the path of success. So. I think we did the right thing. The most sense for like the longevity of the game and ensuring that it's actually successful. You know, we've seen these past company, you know, like in tying back to what Jeff said, you know, it's still the wild, wild west. People are still trying to figure out what actually works and what doesn't. And it seems like in the past, you know, these, these DAOs tied to ETH treasury wallets, it just hasn't um, worked the way that, the way that people have expected them to. And it also is very overcomplicated. So the keeping it simple, um, certainly seems new in the um, play to earn nft gaming space and it appears to be appears that it's going to be way easier to maintain um and ensures longevity of the game um, exactly yeah uh, <clears throat> i think it's uh, interesting but... when you look at like you know we were talking last week you know um the three of us i was talking to jeff about this too like when you look at other projects that have operated like out of a two token model, um, for example, um, our community team was uh, heavily invested at, in Stepin at one point, which is a, a shoe project based on, on the Solana blockchain. Um, that project operated with a two token model. Um, there's another game that we talk about quite often called uh, Axie Infinity. Um, you know, the design, the structure of the way that their ecosystems were designed were amazing. Um, in practice, it worked extremely well. Um, the problem is, is when you have um, a lot of individuals in the community that are attempting to kind of undo the economy and kind of break down the game. Um, eventually what happens is one of the coins, um, it's just what we've seen in, in, in kind of a pattern, one of the coins starts to lose a ton of velocity. Um, people believe that one of them is valued extremely, you know, higher than the other for whatever reason. Um, and then eventually as more velocity is lost, it eventually goes to zero. Um, and then eventually as everybody continues to hound their resources from the project into the other coin, um, there's not as much liquidity to back it up and eventually it will go to zero as well. Um, you know, and so we saw that with Stepin, um, we saw that you know, with Axie Infinity. So um, it's just about kind of assessing what the model actually can do in a few years and um, you know, protecting the bottom line, which is you know, at the end of the day, the ability to constantly be paying people out um, you know, from a stable coin that is backed by the US dollar um, just seemed like a, a, a way to protect ourselves better. Um, Maintain that SLK value. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. You know, one of the things that people uh, that we've never touched on as a community or insiders is um, with going to a cash uh, cash economy, you know, basically shows the community how much the insiders and the executives want to be involved and um, are in the game. Because going to a two token model, you know, the insiders could be selling their tokens at any given time throughout the game, um, you know, there are some internal restrictions, but at the same time, you know, that's their exit strategy. And we've seen that for numerous games. Um, yep. Right yeah. now, you know, right now with, with the game of Silks, there, there is no exit strategy. We're, we're here, we're building it. And, um, and, and that's also another layer of security, not only for the community, but it's also should give the community 
that much of confidence knowing that the company's involved and staying. Yeah, and then it, and, but it also eliminates, um, you know, regulatory risk. Um, right. Yeah, could you expand on that, like, from a legal standpoint? Yeah, I mean, from a legal standpoint, you know, DAOs, DAOs are set up uh, to, to uh, you know, w- w- you know, to implicate the security, to implicate the securities laws, uh, there's a four prong test called the Howey test, and 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 one of the and and one of the prongs in determining whether an asset is a security is whether you're depending on the efforts of others, right? You're buying a token and depending on the efforts of others um, to to create value. And, and this is where DAOs came in, um, uh, w- where they're putting the governance basically to the members, right? Mm-hmm. To eliminate, basically, to take it out of a cla- the class of of being a security, uh, and um, and um, what that di- does, though, is is it, I, I, it, it takes. You're, you're taking valuable management, certain valuable management decisions. I mean, the way a DAO works is is, is that everybody's got to vote on everything, which right. which which can stifle the management. And, and it's inefficient. It can stifle the growth and management of the company. And um, and, and I foresee that the SEC could come back and just say, "Look, DAOs are nonsense. Uh, DAOs are ways of skirting the securities laws." And um, and we're taking that risk out, and we're also putting you know more of the management decision. We're not stifling management from being able to do things that they believe are in the best interests of the community, you know, because everything needs to be voted on by everybody in the DAO. And so, yeah. yeah. And so, and the reason why the SEC uh, a long time ago came came down and said Bitcoin is not a security is because. Bitcoin started so long ago, and there really is no central. Nobody really centrally controls Bitcoin, whereas other tokens that are emerging um, and, and that have emerged, that's not necessarily the case. The case, and um, um, and we don't know where the SEC is going to come out on, on on all these tokens and and and, and which tokens. Um, you know, have decentralized management and, and which tokens are not deemed securities. So we're taking out a lot of that risk and uh, we're making management, we're, we're, we're able to, you know, put more control back into management, which I think, especially when you've got a very capable management team, a very solid management team um, is, is, is really probably better for the community. Yeah, I thought it was interesting what you said about DAOs, you know, especially in like a startup environment. It seems that a DAO, like we said, it's it's inefficient for making making decisions. And in the end, the SEC could just come along and say that it's all nonsense. Um, and no one really knows where that's going to land. Um, Down the road, I think, you know, as Dan was mentioning in the AMA, I think, I mean, part of this is, you know, kind of waiting for these regulatory um, like responses is kind of to wait and see, you know, as it time goes along, it becomes apparent that it is something that is more feasible for us, um, you know, and it's definitely something that we you know, would look into again. Um, it's just a matter of at the current state of uh, you know, what the market looks like right now, especially with um, just a lot of the, the hardships that certain entities are facing uh, with trying to um, profitize off their securities. In yeah. This way. And then let me add one more point. So, so a DAO, um, I, I think DAOs have their place for companies that um, – or for um, projects that are investing in other things, mm-hmm. and where every single participant of the DAO has a ch- can propose an investment into a project and has the right to vote, and it's the community that determines if we make that investment or if we liquidate that investment. But 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 when you're talking about managing an ecosystem, right, it doesn't necessarily make sense to put every single decision. In the hands of um, a community, um, uh, it just it's it's just it's just inefficient. And so, uh, I'm a big supporter of, of this change, of this this turn. One hundred percent. I think DAOs are. When I think of a DAO, I, I think of like a like a 
nonprofit model or something where you're where people are voting on funds to go to a specific um like cause or or sector right. yada yada um yeah i'm totally totally agree with all that yes yeah. this, this has been a this has been an amazing like 40 minutes of discussion i want to oh, right, to uh reset the room see if anybody wants to uh come up and provide you know any commentary or feedback you know on the you know, any of the stuff that we've been talking about, I think this has been one of the best conversations we've had on, on the stable table. It's just uh, Sunday, change the hour, it's football Sunday, so we'll get this thing on YouTube, give people opportunity. Yeah, maybe the hours confuse people. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, Dragon Hot Dog, anyone wants to come on up, um, provide some feedback. I'd love to hear from you guys. You, you said it very, very elegantly and nice. Uh, yes. Um, I, I, I the, the racing community right now, um, th there has been a lot of strategic partnership that just formed that was literally just announced. Uh, FanDuel uh, just bought the uh, only and largest 24-hour um, thoroughbred horse racing uh, station called TVG, which now is called FanDuel TV. But more importantly... They just announced a partnership with Churchill Downs using their back-end software uh, to now help and assist FanDuel to have um, the potential of sports wagering and horse wagering on one wallet or one platform, and it hasn't been done before. Um, and interesting enough, the second largest or the probably the largest thoroughbred horse racing entity, Naira bought 49% of that software. So um, I, I believe that um, the sports wagering and, and horse racing uh, wagering in, in the real world and the communities are really um, aggressively trying to put something together. Um, and again, everything that happens in the real world, sooner or later, it's going to trickle down to the metaverse. So uh, that's my belief. So I think it's on everyone's radar. But like Jeff said, we're very cautious, and we're going to let we're going to let the real world uh, dictate the path that we'll take. Just to uh, be, be a little conservative and uh, you know do it the right way one time. Yeah, and I but while, while the real my my question is is very hypothetical, Troy. I think you're you're really providing some credence to. If it's happening in the real world, we should keep an eye on it. And, it, and it, it's encouraging that you all are, at least it's on your radar, what's going on in the real world and how it translates. Um, my follow-up to you, Troy, would be, not a follow-up, I have a secondary question for you, Troy. Uh, the Keeneland auction that's coming up. So I'm in mm -hmm. this space. Uh, my wife and I have watched some YouTube videos of the auctions, the one that happened in uh, New York recently. And she, you know, her eyes just bulged out of her head when she saw some of the faces <laughs> of these horses. I'm like, yeah, this is what we're in. You know, what we can yeah. have. Can you share with the team, with, with the community here, and those that will listen later on, you know, what, what should we look for since some of these uh, yearlings are going to be in our, uh, in our pool that we could mint? You know, what are we <laughs> looking for during the auction? You know, what, what kind of tips and tricks uh, should we look for? I know education is coming, but you know maybe at a thirty thousand foot level, as we we have a chance to even watch it live on on YouTube. I think some of these things are streamed live. Uh, what what yeah. to look for? You know, um, j just and I'll answer that um, on Tuesdays and Fridays. We started doing a Twitter space just called All About Horses, um, and it's myself and uh, Charles Simon owns. Uh, Go, going in circles podcast and, and we're going to have other bloodstock agents. Yep. And you, <laughs> and, um, and, uh, we're, we're gonna, um, we're going to break down the sale, uh, especially leading into the horse sales. So hypothetically, you know, hit number three sold for $2 million. We're, we're going to literally break down the page of, of the breeding aspect of it. And then, um, a lot of these horses, myself personally, I, I'll be there, so I'll see some of the physical aspects of it. Um, so the, the horse sale alone, watching it and seeing it, you could, um, you'll be able to see just the look of the horse on TV, and um, and then if the look of the horse 
then dictates the price of the horse, you'll know that the horse physically was also um, very sound, meaning that his x-rays, his throat, veterinarians, uh, uh, you know, gave the thumbs up saying that they believe this horse is going to be a racehorse or make it to the races. So th th that's the only thing that I could tell you when we start seeing very high price horses, especially for the breeding. Now, the one thing on a high level is if you, you know, especially on Monday and Tuesday, um, you're going to see many million dollar horses being sold. Um, but some of those horses should have sold for a million dollars and they didn't. And the reason being is, like I just said, how a veterinarian and the x-rays and everyone gave it the thumbs up and believes that physically he's going to be a racehorse also. The, and then the opposite is true when sometimes a horse uh, that we believe should be going for a million dollars and no one even bids on it. So that's the one thing that you'll see in the horse sale uh, come Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is there'll be a fluctuation in prices and it, it might not be understandable, but that's usually that part of it that physically he doesn't uh he's not up to par to his uh bloodlines so that's the only thing i could say but it, it's the most exciting uh sale it's uh you know the new york sales are are great but the first couple of days of keelan they're just you know again we're selling four thousand horses in 13 days it's like 300 horses a day and um you know the prices you know literally range from you know a thousand dollars to i believe three years ago um or two two or three years ago um oh someone uh a matter of fact a woman who owns um the dollar dollar store you know bought a philly for nine million dollars you know out of this sale so it, it's pretty cool to, to to watch that stuff wow thank you thank you um Real quick, we got Eddie Gold on stage to kind of wrap it up for us. Kind of the last uh, last question before we close up. Uh, coming on an hour. Eddie Gold. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. I'll be brief. I know it's already uh, the end of the time. Uh, my question is from a legal point of view uh, about the business mode. I mean, let's say we are successful as I expect. People are going to try and emulate us. Uh, what's going to make us unique? There are many things, but one of the things is if it's regulatory, how to do what we are doing. So I'm just wondering how difficult would it be to replicate us from the legal point of view? Thank you. Um, you know, Jeff, let me answer this uh, first and then you can, thank you. I'll answer it, then you could do the regulatory thing. Like, like anything else, um, you know, I always give this example. You know, there there's Domino's, Pizza Hut, and Papa John's. And they're all worth billions on top of billions of dollars. Um, you know, Coca Cola, Pepsi. You know, Apple, IBM. It, it, it that people can try to rep, replicate this. The one thing is, thoroughbred horse racing has been around for thousands of years, um, and no one, for some odd reason came up with the idea of not just putting a fantasy horse racing game, but taking the whole thoroughbred racing community, the whole, everything that is in there and gamifying it inside the metaverse. Um, we're going to be there first. Normally, if a company is there first, that means that the people and the um let's say the real horse community and the companies that will be partnering with us that will be coming onto the metaverse and as long as we're successful and they believe in us they're going to always want to be with the best company out there and that's who we believe that we are going to be so if someone else does come just as a business point they're not going to have the ability to grow as fast as we do or be in the places and have the relationships that we have currently today. So for me, as an owner of a company, I'm not so concerned that someone else is gonna try to go ahead and replicate us. Um, when we're successful, like anything else, then everyone's gonna try. But I, I do believe the team that we have, the technology that we're building, um, 
it, it's not going to hurt us or hurt our business model. Boom. Jeff, any follow up? Um, can, can you re, can you rephrase the question again? As far as regulatory, you you, you mentioned it was kind of a regulatory yeah. question. As you first understand how hard it would be uh, legally for a new company to do what we are doing in the future. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, yeah, I mean, this goes back to what Troy says. Uh, you know, any a, a, anybody can go in and 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 uh, there's nothing preventing anybody from trying to try, trying to trying to do what we're doing. But as Troy said, it's it's um, you know we're first. Uh, we're developing strong partnerships, and um, and we've got a a seasoned management team, not just of of technology, uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, but we've got Troy, who's uh, knows the business and and has been involved in the business for I don't know how many years, Troy, but but uh, you know the combination of of, of that. And again, what Troy, what what it, what it boils down to is what Troy said is is the relationships and the partnerships that we're developing that that's going to be, uh, I think, w one of our barriers to entry. And does that answer your question? It does. It does. Thank you very much. It does. So Absolutely. Much. Troy, Jeff, thank you guys so much for uh, for joining the stable table with us. Uh, yeah, we loved so having you guys. Any time, any time. I'm just uh, sad that, that that you didn't ask me sooner. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's interesting getting the legal perspective. Yeah, just love it. We're gonna, gonna go ahead. Any time.